Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Napoleon Total War. Yes, I know this game hasn't gone fast, but I've been having fun playing it. To me, um, the playing of the game is more fun than just crushing your enemies super fast. Now, of course, I don't like losing either. That's another, another sort of... Um, thing all together. Okay, let's come here. We're going after Belgrade. Oh, hit the user wrong button. Some games it's a left click. Some games it's a right click for this or that or the other thing. And I'm constantly jumping back and forth between games, so I get confused. Okay, you're coming along. Okay, well, let's... Anything more? <laughs> Take Belgrade. Now we're gonna give this to the Austrians if we take it. Siege them. Um, we'll let them surrender if they want to. Siege broken. Peacefully occupy it. Yes, that's our point. Yeah. Let's see if we can keep the Austrian suite here by turning this over to them and keep them with a big enough yes, Austria open negotiations regions, offer region um, oh, there it is scrolling, okay um, the Balkans uh-huh Good. And yes, that pushes our people out of the capital, but hey, there we go. That is good. So now we have a much larger and hopefully stronger Austrian Empire. We still have to deal with Budapest so they can get Austria hungry. And Prussia is doing fair enough, I think, at the moment. We'll give them Thuringian here soon. And how is our navy doing? Um, coming down this way. We want to control as much of the trade as we can. Yeah. And here, um, join them. That will increase their trade. And here, these are war vessels. Um, hmm. don't know particularly where to go because I don't know that there's any more enemies in this part of the Mediterranean so we only have Spain along here so I guess we'll head this way Underway. okay we'll get into lecture mode here for a moment the way I have been playing this campaign to me is in many ways, the sort of <clears throat> classic British strategy is um, control of the seas. Um, you know, it's um, very much what eventually, after this period, Alfred Thayer Mahan looks at the history. Um, influence, as the book is, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, is called um, for short, Influence of History, or Influence of um, Naval Warfare Upon History, or some some variant of that uh, I have the book on my shelf but yeah and so France has interior lines they can dash around and um, move a um, good big bunch of armies 
rapidly out from the center and um, can do that. But the British can move around now that we've basically cleared the seas unmolested. <coughs> hmm. Excuse me. There we go. Um, unmolested um, at sea and cut trade. And you know, obviously this is a somewhat simplistic game, but um, by controlling this trade, we have controlled, we get so much money <coughs> and can, you know, really do, afford to do all, you know, build fleets, um, armies, improvements. It really shows up that um, what is doable. Now we are at least temporarily possessing a lot of the European continent, which we will give up as time goes on, but um, I guess um, so sort of the Mackinder or um, no, yeah no, it, um, yeah McKin yeah um, sort of direct approach as I was talking about with Napoleon and Abel and France and other people, but France has a long history of doing it having this sort of direct ability to send an army out to confront their enemies um, directly um, had been reasonably successful. Um, the various Louis with their armies, you know, the Bur if you especially if you look at it as the Bourbon Empire, not the French Empire. Um, I just sort of recently got done watching the end of the Versailles series that deals more or less with young or fairly young um, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, you know, wanting to increase the French Empire, increase the French Empire. Um, well, France, in a way, does, but not does that very well. You know, they lose out in the Americas. You know, okay, keep Louisiana for a while, but eventually, by the time you you, you get around to Napoleon, he's selling that off to the Americans. They hold on to some tenuous colony out in India, but really it's mostly a British show after a while. And there is, at, well, at this time nationalism is rising, but before this, in the 17th and early 18th century, nationalism isn't that big of a thing. Um, you know, the in the Austrian Empire, the language of the elites is, of course, French. Probably thought I was going to say German. No, the language of the elites in the Austrian Empire is French. So when the nobles talk to each other, they speak in French for the most part. Um, that's probably overstating it somewhat, um, but it's definitely a thing. And if you were anything of a um, wanting to try to be a sophisticate, you knew some or a lot, or a lot of French. And I don't know what a Frenchman would make of the French that they spoke. Um, you know, whether it would sound French or whether it would sound foreign, probably it would sound foreign to them. But that is sort of the, the language of the elites, was, was French in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or the Austrian Empire, I should say. Roll that back a little bit in time. So um, now all of these French speakers are not Frenchmen. They are mostly Germans, because even you start getting into, um, you know, the hung what becomes the Hungarian part of the empire, particularly early on, a lot of the elites are what we would generally speak of as Germans, though you go back far enough, you know, uh, what's a German, what, what isn't a German, um, may sort of blur a bit, you know. Is it is a German anybody in the Holy Roman Empire, so does that include a Bohemian, or, you know, or is it speak? Is it just somebody who speaks German? And you know, so that can stretch and contract. It's not not as clear cut, maybe, to some people at different times. So you've got this sort of French speaking elite that often would be speaking to each other um, across the table, 
whether it's at breakfast or at the salons or whatever, in French with each other, and then speak to their servants, you know, drop into German to speak to their servants, and then back to speaking into French. So there wasn't this nationalism. This nationalism, now, there may be a um, anti-foreignism, but that's different. Because foreigners, you know, those damn dirty foreigners could just be the people living in, on the other side of the mountain that, you know, it's not even, you know, whether, you know, a simple hill valley that you might travel back and forth over. But the foreigners could be just the guys on the other side of the mountain. It doesn't matter if they, well, they're, they're Italian, German, whatever language is different, spoke than ours. They're just dirty foreigners over there, whatever they are. They don't have to be in this sort of modern, and I'm using this language, um, this modern concept when you say that they think uh like in america at least oh brown people are scary you know brown that's your people you're demeaning no i just mean the dirty foreigners you know now i wish this would scroll a little bit faster you know if you're living over here the dirty foreigners over here in england you know i'm not talking you know about a different race a different culture in a in a broad sense it's just foreign people than you know um and the more obviously the more language difference the more cultural difference you know the dirtier or whatever they are so um that's a um thing nationalism grows up in in Europe, really sort of in the French Revolution, and as a reaction to the French Revolution, because the French revolutionaries, the soldiers as they march, spread this nationalism, and um, uh, a lot of people go, yeah, 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 but F you, we're Italians now, we're, we're you know, um, and so this gets back to the idea that a lot of, you know, this this region in here isn't clear as to whether this is France or this is Italy. This is just this region. And so is this part of the French Empire or not? Well, so, like I say, nationalism isn't a very strong thing. But there are definitely local and regional powers, other power balances, say Prussia or Austria, bouncing out France. So when France is looking like, for various reasons, getting hold of Spain, and it's not just Spain, it's all of the colonies. I mean, if it was just Spain, it probably wouldn't have been that big of a um, heartache to a lot of people. It would have been some of it. But and even though it's way off somewhere that you're never going to go, and it's just on this map that looks big, and it's probably thought to be very primitive all of the americas that spain owns because you got to realize um outside of portugal owning brazil which brazil looks like a big place today but it, brazil was just a sort of a thin strip of coastline at the time because of its geography and jungles it was quite a valuable colony shall we say but you couldn't really penetrate it easily very deep and part of that, of course, is just the disease and whatnot going on with the jungle. But Spain, which um, gets, you know, so much of the rest of South America, including a lot of the high altitude places, you know, Peru and whatnot, that they can go into and exploit. It gets big. And then you've got all the way up into what is today Mexico, or at that time was New Spain, I believe it was called, um, in the north. And a lot of the Caribbean islands, um, including the big um, uh, Cuba, that that was just a huge money maker. And, you know, by this time, you know, in what was this year date, um, 1811, obviously, uh, much of the Americas, you know, are independent now. But before that, you have the only other real major player in the Americas are the British. So you have the, you know, the America or the... Um, the British and the Spanish are the major power players over there. Yeah, there are some French islands that produce money. The Dutch have a couple of islands. You know, there's a, f you know, and we've already talked about the Portuguese. You know, there's a few other um, countries on there, but it's really sort of an America or a um, 
the Americas are uh, a British and um, Spanish concern, really. So that's what, it's not how many sheep, and sheep is a major, um, uh, I want to say crop, but a, a major um, livestock element in Spain, uh, both for their meat and their cloth, or, you know, their wool. Um, you know, it's not just, oh, uh, and, you know, France is going to have the extra population and the extra industry and whatnot of Spain. That is a concern, but not as big as, oh, they've got all this money. And, of course, at the time, you do have things like, you know, the, early enough on, the Spanish Netherlands. But by that time, that's part of the reason things shift over to being um, uh, into the Habsburg hands when it splits off between because that was sort of the Spanish Netherlands Habsburgs get Spain they're looking like they're going to be the European Empire again France's reaction to this again to this thing is to want to grow its empire and want to getting hold of it so the Habsburgs are losing and there's a a whole major war fought over Spain but the settlement basically at the end of the war is that Spain will not be part of the French Empire but it will be a Bourbon monarchy and that Bourbon king cannot be the same Bourbon king that's the king of France so unlike where in Britain you have the situation of the Stuarts being the kings up in Scotland and um, Elizabeth um, Tudor dying without um, heir and um, well no no children of her own I mean obviously she has heirs but not of her own and that's the Stuart King and so very much at the start for both countries neither of the countries wanted to be ruled by the other and there had been a long history of wars between them but they were reasonably satisfied the Scots were. Oh, you mean we don't have to worry about the English invading us anymore if we have put our king onto their throne and we will get to rule ourselves? And the English were like, yeah, but you're not showing up with a bunch of Scottish nobles to rule us? And their voters, their parliament doesn't get to say what? Okay, yeah, so separate parliaments, separate governments, separate armies, even very much at first separate navies, though that pretty quickly goes away. Scotland doesn't have much of a naval, has a bit of a shipping, but not not much of a naval tradition um, in a modern sense. So the the Scottish government, both locally and the overall royal government that's sort of jointly running things, basically stops any funding for a Scottish navy, keeps up a Scottish army um, because it's useful um, for various things including fighting in civil wars um, and starting civil wars and whatnot. So having a Scottish army is a useful thing. Um, so that becomes a same king to countries as opposed to because there were and they, um, well, yeah, James is an only child, um, but they could have done a settlement in which that because James does have um, well, he has, uh, what, two, three children? Um, Charles I is the second son, Henry, um, Prince Henry, who was going to be Henry the Ninth, and named after the Tudor Henrys, just to sort of make... You guys need to come down here. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Charles has uh, another brother, but they could have specified that, say, their successor would have to be a um, uh, a different king than. Um, different king than the one that is, you know, king in um, 
Edinburgh or a different one that's king in London. So I know this is getting a bit off track. Um, but so get back to the, the central thing. So France is successful in, or the Bourbons are successful in spreading their, using their direct power force to spread their monarchy into Spain, into the Bourbon kings, into southern Italy, more or less, through Spain. So the Bourbons get um, the predominant position in, in Europe, and there is very little conflict between them. But they sort of, it's sort of the direct approach. You can't quite consolidate it down. And Napoleon is obviously aware of this, as this is why every time that he beats um, Austria, he may take something away from Austria, like eventually this, the Dalmatian coast for France, but always leaves Aust the, the Habsburgs as a ruling um, monarchy, because, and then similarly with the Prussians. And, um, and he finally makes his big mistake by putting his um, brother on the kingdom of Spain, and that is just seen as just a step too much. And so you get Spain. Spain's revolt on it. Um, and so that's all the direct approach, is directly hitting at, and I think long ago I could have marched um, armies onto Paris and taken it and taken out um, the French mainly do that because a lot of their armies were out here. But I did not want to do that because I wanted to play and am playing the indirect approach of supporting my allies, of nibbling away at it, which I think is ultimately a more realistic approach. Well, we're going to end this turn. I know I've talked a lot. Okay. Um, no, we don't, we don't have a great um, reason to go to peace right now. He'll be disappointed. Hmm. What is he going to do? Start a war with me? Oh, wait. He already has. Okay. We have a new agent in Provence. Good. Agent detected. some Austrians which you know they might just decide to do something okay guys you're still in very good shape let's let's head this way I'm hoping the Austrians can hold out here with their new province Okay, well, uh, some of these 28, 33, 52, we're going to let you guys continue to recruit up before we even go attack the one outpost there. Now, here, um, Bohemia, that would look like a good province for Austria, so, um, Let's see if we come here. Rats in a cave. Well, we're gonna. The swine rot in the sty. We're gonna pick up this army here. And we're gonna come right to here. Anything more? 
I think we're going to let them rot inside for a little while. Like he says. Now, how is our army doing here? Okay, they look in good shape. They look in good shape. I want to pursue... Um, Well, because they do have a fairly large armies here that we spot. Ah. Well, at least they have eight cannons. So let's grab this army here and come down this way. I want to get Barcelona back. Okay, let's grab the, shall we say, healthy units here. I think we'll leave the horse just to... Oh, what a... Well, yeah. We'll go out with an infantry <laughs> army only. Yeah, we'll play this one out. This is about, but okay. Um, I have been encouraged, and I think I will at some point make some um, sort of informational videos. Um, let's grab a proper foot unit to talk about the square and such, um, some of the formations. And I know there's different levels of um, knowledge here. Okay. Damn this weather, sir. Wet powder makes Miss Files oh, a shut certainty. up. I'm trying to get to look at the front of these guys in here this way. Uh, I want to zoom in, but if I go, I need to go to the top there. Okay. Yeah. If I go to the center, my cursor just goes off. Okay. Nah, that drum's way too small. Way too small. Um, but I do like that they did this. Musicians in the British Army... Um, had their jackets in the color of the facings of the um, uniforms now and yeah it did sort of change but a facings originally would be the un the back color of the coat here um, would have been yellow along with the collar yellow and the cuffs yellow now that varied from unit to unit um, there was I think even one or two units that had red facings but um, that's sort of the facings of the jacket. The jacket color, which eventually becomes red as a standard in the British Army, um, very much so the standard by the um, the American Civil, or the American Revolution, I should say. Um, now the militia and um, non-regulars, not defensibles, but the the militia units, um, and even though they're calling this militia here. Regiment of militia. Militia in Britain wore blue coats. Regulars wore red coats. Artillery wore blue coats. It gets a bit complicated, I know. But um, so, but basic colors for the British Army are red coats. Faced various colors, various shades. That's to tell the units apart. Not all units, but most units would then have their musicians, this would be a fifer and this would be the drummer, would um, have their coats in the facing color, but they're faced, uh, this, this on that shows that it's a musician, this sort of wings thing shows that it's a musician, but the collar should be red, the cuffs should be red, and as you can see here, the facing of the, the coattails um, are red to match that, so it's sort of a mirrored image. Uh, 
generally the drum would be painted with um, the regimental um, standard and sort of insignia type thing and painted the color of the facing so it would be yellow in this case and this is just the standard one and so that's what the, they would do I know that's more information in detail um, this is the Balearic Shako um, which is sort of a later Napoleonic era Shako that's a um, a cover for rain or whatever that's what it looks like without the cover and it's sort of done I guess coming out of the Balearic Island style and that it, it's has sort of a higher front um, this is the peak the peak if you talk about a peaked cap this is the peak the peak comes off out the front it's not the top it's here this is often mistaken in modern caps which uh, call something a peaked cap and the people are referring to that no it's this it's the thing that keeps the sun and the rain out of the eyes is the peak uh, but the shako the sort of traditional British shakos didn't have this sort of taller front um, bit as we can see yes, uh, no damn it um, damn it oh damn it Infantry! Yes, sir. Oh, come on just what I didn't want to have happen. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. So, um, this is sort of a later Napoleonic type, the Balearic cap. Yes, I know too much about all of this. Many of you may have thought I just knew about World War II uniforms. Uh, sorry, no, I know a lot, a lot about a lot of different periods. Okay, so. This formation works in many ways like a machine gun in that you're doing sort of volley fire. Um, they are a um, 75 caliber brown bass musket. Um, we're not really sure. There's different theories on where brown bass comes into it. It would prob properly be called a tower musket. Um, it is the largest of the standard um, calibers that I know of, at least in the mu horse and musket era. Um, <clears throat> so it's the shoots the biggest ball. Generally, I would say it's about a 70 caliber ball coming out of the 75 caliber. So the ball actually bounces as it goes down. It's not that it has a little bit of slop in it. It actually sort of bounces as it goes down the barrel. One of the good attributes of this is that um, the British can use ammunition from every other army in Europe. Captures ammunition um, and, you know, paper cartridges, and they can use the paper cartridges. So they can shoot a, you know, a 60, a 58 caliber, whatever, French 68 caliber, some of them were. That they do, yeah. I think it's more 68 caliber by the time you get into the Napoleonic era. Look, eh, early 18th century, they're, they're shooting more of a 60 caliber ball. Um, but um, so that you can pour, put down anybody's ammunition you capture down your musket, and so they would be shooting stuff that's that much smaller down the musket, so it's getting that much more inaccurate as to the last bounce as it goes out the barrel. Um, so yeah, um, and also another good thing is, is nobody else can use your ammunition because it's too big. Now, of course, they would capture ammunition after the battles, and I believe, don't know how much, but I do believe that some degree, they would, of course, um, disassemble the ammunition, take the powder out to reuse it. British powder is generally considered the best, at least on large-scale armies and remelt the lead down to um, the right caliber. Lots and lots of soldiers carried um, lead molds with them. And then, of course, they can even use the little paper parts of the cartridge if they want to. And paper wasn't as so common. In the American Revolution, it was quite common to use newspaper for making cartridges because it was available. Um, so, um, like I say, paper wasn't, you know, Newspapers were fairly common, obviously, but how much paper do you need to fill out, you know, to make 60 rounds for every guy out here, or even just 30 rounds for every guy out there? Lots and lots of paper. So the soldiers on hand would do that. And so there was um, 
because I know soldiers in many armies, not necessarily every soldier, but lots of soldiers carried bullet molds. And so that they would be getting led either through their um, uh, supply chain or through capturing it and um, remaking it. But that was, shall we say, time consuming and not that efficient. There were definitely ammunition factories for all the major nations. So that would take them time to use British ammo. But on the field, if this unit has shot up most of its ammunition and there's a bunch of dead Frenchmen out in front of them, they could send out a few people to go get the cartridge boxes. Um, uh, you probably already know, but again, I don't know. Um, these things really should be more on the side of the hip here. Those are the cartridge boxes. They would have a, um, a block of wood inside of them it's a leather leather cartridge um, box. That's a canteen, I guess, is what we're seeing on this side there. Which really be yeah, which really should be the cartridge box where that canteen is. Um, so it's a it's a leather stiff leather um, box. Have a block of wood in it that then has holes drilled into the wood the size of the paper cartridge that would go into. So they would sort of be you could blindly reach in and pull out a cartridge ready to go. And so you bring back a bunch of enemy um, cartridge boxes and just sort of toss them to your soldiers and they could immediately start using the ammunition. But after, definitely after about 60 rounds uh, out of your musket, your musket is almost non-functional in that it has built up so much powder. That is part of the reason why there is so much um play in the, uh, you know, gaps in the musket um, to, um, uh, you know, for the balls going out is because you have powder buildup, black powder leaves a lot of fouling in the barrel. And the high standard for militaries was 60 rounds. Low standard was 30 rounds per man. Um, and it varies. And I'm talking about how many cartridges would fit into a cartridge box. There are specialty cartridge boxes and things that could um, hold up to about 120 rounds. Often elite units would be equipped with those, but those were, were rare things. Um, this, the backpack that they have, and yes, I know all this from memory. I know too much about this. This is, I believe, a trotter backpack. Um, it is painful to wear. This was the new advanced British backpack. Uh, I think it is more painful to wear than the older one. Um, what this is, um, this backpack, there is a wooden square frame in there that makes this nice square shape. Um, these flaps would open up, and so this, what is here the back, would sort of open up. Not the top like we would think of in a modern backpack. The um, this would sort of fold out. So you would put your extra clothing and other gear um, in here and then tie it up. And it was, I think, a bit, bit of an oiled cloth to help keep water out, but it wasn't like the leather cloth of the cartridge boxes. These are very small cartridge boxes for this, the period for the British. These are more like you see on the continent for about a 30 round cartridge box. Um, this is a sort of mess tin here, and this is your, your blanket here. So with the straps and the wooden frame, this would be cutting into all the soldiers' back and would be quite painful. The earlier British backpacks, um, I won't get into, but uh, they weren't quite as formed up, um, didn't look quite as smart. So um, the Trotter Company, or Trotter himself, who I think owned the Trotter Company, designs this backpack. And the officers think it just looks so lovely, so they make the soldiers wear it. And yes, it hurts a lot, especially marching with it all day. Um, and then you also have your canteen. Um, this cross belt here that you're seeing, one of the cross belts holds the cartridge box. Again, that's why it's not supposed to be on the back of your butt. It's one of these cross belts holds the um, cartridge box. The other cross belt that goes across holds your bayonet. Originally, it was um, a bayonet and sword, but by the 18th century, all but a few, but a few um, grenadier guards type units had given up using carrying the sword. Um, 
for just carrying the bayonet. The bayonet was thought of as a weapon in and of itself, just as a big sort of dagger knife type thing. Um, so that's what it, that um, the canteen would be on another strap and the trotter backpacks that were heavier than either the bayonet or the um, uh, cartridge box um, would have very thin straps on the shoulders, again, increasing the pain of the wearer uh, as opposed to nice broad ones that we see here. Um, yeah, that's sort of this. Okay, so this is obviously a three rank um, set up here. Three ranks, I would say, is probably the most common um, setup for the time period. Basically, it allows two of the ranks to load and shoot. The third rank is a reserve. Um, and that varies, and I, I'm saying that, and I'm thinking, yeah, because you can definitely see um, good um, drawings of first rank kneeling, third rank sort of crouching over the the first rank or the, you know, the second rank crouching over the, the first rank and then the third rank standing up front and I can all fire at once and that definitely did happen but um, and it depends on the army the Prussians liked platoon firing so this platoon figure a few men here would fire and then this platoon and then this platoon would fire and then this platoon, and then this platoon would fire, and then finally this platoon, and this platoon would fire. So it would ripple out from the center of the battalion. The whole platoon would fire, and then start loading. And then this platoon, and then the, so at the same time, you know, it was the center one would fire, and then the next two out would fire, and then the next two out, and then the next two out. Each would fire, you know, after, give a sort of a beat. To fire so the so while this one's loading and so by the, the designed by the time for this is the Prussian system um, so by the time the the outermost platoon had fired the idea was this platoon was ready to fire again so you had a constant rippling of fire from from a Pr Prussian unit so they would set up and it would just start constant fire um, you know boom you know boom Brum, brum, or whatever the, the, the sort of spacing would be. And so they would all fire, like I said, sort of like a machine gun, in that they would a volley fire all at once. And so all three ranks, if they were set up in a three rank thing, would fire at once. Often, I think they may the Prussians may have been doing it two ranks, but I'd have to look all that up. Um, and so that they would keep this up with platoon firing. So, in essence, a constant firing of a battalion or line sometimes they would even fire in a big enough thing by company or by battalion so one battalion would fire and then outer and so the whole line so the prussians were big into firepower they really liked that firepower and that was really a um a sort of constant now you can only keep it up you only got 30 rounds for most I think Prussians were, were a 30 round cartridge box so you're going to run out of ammunition pretty quickly and unless you have a good stiff breeze not just a breeze but a good stiff breeze you're going to make it so that no one can see each other out between the lines you can see each other within within the line but too much um, uh, gunpowder out um, smoke out in front of you so now where the British were more fire by the ranks, so they would fire the front rank and then fire the second rank and then fire the front rank and then fire the second rank and then fire the, the front rank. And because it takes a while, I mean, it's not that fast, you're getting at best three rounds a minute out of control fire at best, I would say. Um, and it definitely once you've gotten the first because you can try to cheat and get a little bit more you know your first firing um loading up you know so but time it takes you to load and shoot you can get about three rounds so what's that about you know 20 seconds no boy that's bad um yeah about 25 seconds um out of um for for shooting per 
per rank. Um, and so you front rank fires, rear rank fires, front rank fires, rear rank fires. Oops, somebody's charging in with horse. Um, that well, I was saying front and middle rank, but the so then you know then the um, the rear rank would be able to fire. So they are sort of constantly set up with the ability to fire. So it's always a reserve. And of course, if somebody sort of surprises you from the back, they can turn and shoot. So the idea of a British line, a battalion like this, is two ranks actively sh firing and shooting. The third rank is a reserve. That is at least the standard procedure. Now, of course, like I say, they did practice and could do a full battalion volley and that would be devastating and you would time it probably to be right about you know oh i don't know here i mean this close this is pretty damn close and it, that would just mow through just everything now okay this an intact line is almost unbreakable um so the idea of firing at it is what you're trying to, to break it because the real weapon of these units for most people are these things, the bayonets. That's what kills, does most of the killing in these wars. Um, Hathorn White, uh, uh, Philip Hathorn White, I think is how you pronounce his name. It's a very long last name. It has a really nice book on this, and I don't have a copy of it right now available that gives... They did some study of how many um, shots were fired in a battle um, and tried to go count up how many soldiers were actually shot in that, you know, the enemy shot, or for some number of units. And then they also did, you know, during the later 18th century, I think post-American Revolution, but before the Napoleonic era, fired at, you know, having these guys firing at... Um, uh, wooden targets, you know, that looked like enemy soldiers placed up there, and then went and counted the musket ball hits at different ranges, and found out that very, very few of the shots actually hit the enemy. Very few. What actually did it was most of the killing was these things. But, like I say, this is almost unbreakable. Now, so there's what you're trying to do is trying to break up this line by killing some people with musket balls and then coming in with your sharp pointy things okay now um, so like I say this is clearly the the best unbreakable horse cavalry also has basically no ability to break this horses you, you might not believe this, but horses don't like to run on, run into sharp, pointy things. They just, they just have an objection to it, even if their rider is trying to ride them straight into this. So, if you can stand here as a cavalry unit comes charging at you as fast as you can, as they can, and not run away, and trust me, having a horse, just even one horse sort of run at you, is a damn scary prospect. I don't know if you've ever had a horse run at you, but it's a damn scary prospect. They're big, they're fast, they're heavy, they will run right over you. But if you can stay um, steady, they're going to almost always fail. Now, of course, it also is really good to blast them right into the, in the face with a, um, a musket volley. That will drop some horses, mess them up. Generally speaking, and unfortunately, I can't have them... Well. Um, well, they won't do that either. Okay. Um, is the if the horses are coming, the front rank goes down to kneeling and then grounds or puts the the butt of the musket into the ground, using this now as a pike. And it's these um, rear two ranks are the only ones that tend to fire. Um, the 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 grounded rank becomes the reserve for firing. The other two ranks are the load and shoot rank. So that stops it. But if you can come with your horses uh, like this, 
you're going to be just fine. You know, if you can come at the unit just like that, because some are going to be coming around, this corner is not going to hold. It's just not enough to hold. Um, and so you're, you're not going to do well. And your unit will falter, obviously, if you come from the rear, even with a re reserve rank, seeing and, and, and in enough time turning to face it, generally speaking, you're going to lose. This takes care of that problem. You no longer have a flank they can come on. Again, at minimum, and I think they're doing this as a... Um, well, it, it depends on the situation, but um, the front rank is, again, definitely the grounding and not shooting rank. The rear rank or ranks are the ones that shoot out of it. The colors are in the center with um, the officers and the musicians are stand in the center of this formation. This is the vulnerable bit here, right here on the unit are the corners, because this guy can only face, you know, so many ways. Um, there, I think, was only one case of a British square that was properly formed up in good strength that didn't decide to, and some of the times the, the horse, the cavalry would charge, and the Spanish, the Portuguese, the whoever, oh shit, they're coming, and then they'll start running away. So if, and then of course that fails, but there was only, I think, one case of a French charge onto a British square that was properly formed up that actually broke the square throughout the entire Napoleonic period one time. So we can see that this is a highly effective formation. The problem with this formation is, well, let's leave that there. Is the, um, oh. Oh, come on. Is this? Who's shooting at who the most? All of these guys, even if it's just two ranks, who's shooting at who the most? These guys are only going to get shot away, and this square is going to collapse. So, if you are presented with a line of troops versus this square, this square is going to collapse just because of the concentration of firepower. Equal number of soldiers isn't going to work out. Also, if you have artillery, and if at long range, you know, way back over here, they'll be able to skip the rounds that normally bounce, will bounce through, or even if they're just going through, more people. Often rounds would hit in front and maybe bounce over these guys, or just go over the top or whatever. Now, of course, a lot of times they would bounce and take out a few people, but if you see solid shot, it's going to do some damage, and yeah, you can, I can see a path where it can take out more than three people at once um, as it passes through here, and often it wouldn't take out anybody, you know, it would miss, or it would just take out one or two people, and they would close the ranks up. Because if you start to spread out, the horse can come in and take you apart. Or the other enemy units would come in and um, blast you apart. So you keep close. Horse primarily is what keeps close. Keeping close is a bad idea. But being run over by horse is even a worse idea. So they would keep close. Now once the artillery gets closer, they can use canisters normally. What we people sometimes call grape shot. But canister is, is a, normally in a can. And um, it's a bunch of musket balls in a can, so they can load it into the... Um, but it can be in a bag, it can be in other things. Um, it can just be loose, but loaded into a um, cannon and shot as a great big shotgun. Well, that can be devastating, and is devastating at the right range to this, this formation here. But look at this formation, because the way it spreads out is it spreads out in a circle. Canister spreads out in a circle. So, as the wider it gets, the taller it gets. So, a bunch of the rounds, and since they're not that big, especially if they're just musket balls, they're not really going to, and even if they bounce once, um, like I 
I was hit, I, you know, I should say, hit in the leg by a, a bullet once. Now, this bullet was shot. I was behind, maybe not directly, because I was uh, behind a firing line of a bunch of machine guns. Um, they were shooting, and I was behind the direction they were shooting. So it had gone, it had hit something out there, and somehow come back. And so I felt a sort of like that, a thump in my leg. Didn't even hardly hurt, but what was that? And I looked down and I see a bullet uh, in the gravel right below me that I could, that was fresh. Oh, I got hit in the shin. So, um, you know, so it, it was just like somebody sort of tossing, you know, not, not a whole cartridge, but just a bullet, just sort of tossing a bullet at, at you and hit, hitting you in the leg, you know. It didn't hurt, didn't break the skin, didn't even cause a bruise. I'm serious, you know, so it's not like, oh, I had a bullet wound. No, I didn't have a bullet wound, but a bullet hit me that had left a barrel of a gun. Well, a round lead, lead ball after it hits particularly soft earth, but even if it hits a rock or something, it's going to mash and it's going to lose all of its force. So even if it's coming out of a cannon, if it's hitting the ground, it's not going to, even if it bounces, it's not going to do serious harm unless it hits you in the eye because I wish if this bullet had hit me in the eye and maybe if it hit me in the face it would have left a bruise or something but you know it you know you know it wasn't anything really serious you know sort of like if a BB hits you in the eye yeah if it does okay so as you wear safety glasses if you're actually having BB gun wars or or whatever but um, so here you know, so all the rounds that, you know, as it spreads out right and left, don't do any good. And all the rounds go over the top, don't do any good. But as you can see here, if the bullets are coming here, the rounds go here. But they're also coming over the top, but then they're losing their trajectory. Some of them, you know, because some of them will hit the ground in front. Some of them will hit the ground behind. And so you can be hitting here. So you blast holes through and you, so you can see you can especially if you hit it at this right spot a big shotgun blast do a cone out from here you could devastate this square with artillery so that is so between for artillery and musket units this square is a very bad idea but for horse it's a very good idea there is one other type of square that is not in this game. It is called a rally square. It is for when you're in this formation and oh shit, here comes the horse running like from behind the hill or running at you um, and you have no time to do form the square, which somebody shouts, you don't form a square. When somebody shouts form the square, you don't form the square. Your sergeant says, Third platoon to the right face, face forward march ten step ten paces or he counts them off stop, turn to the left face move and so all of these units, they sort of know everybody knows the lieutenants, the sergeants know what their platoon because you're getting from this to this, so this platoon needs to march to here march to there. You know, turn right and then face in that direction. This platoon needs to turn right and face in this. So you can see only these guys here, who obviously they're thinner walled here, aren't don't have to move. Everybody else has to. You know, so you have they don't sort of all wander. You know, hey guys, yeah, my spot is over here, so I'm gonna go direct. No, they they march and face about. Um, there was one movie they um, talked. I think it was. Um, West Point cadets before the Civil War or something. One guy was going, one um, you know cadet was repeating all of, going through out of memory all of the orders it takes to move a um, a battalion from a um, either battalion or company I forget which from a line to a square. You know, first platoon to the right march and and giving them a sequence and then going back to it and so you ha the officers had to memorize this sequence and so this platoon just does what this platoon says this platoon you know is told and so each one of these platoons do all these sort of marching about things to get them into square that takes a long time and if the horses are already coming you have no chance and it's worse than being um, in a line it's called a so what I'm talking about is a rally square so it's like oops here they come or they're already here. They've already smashed into us. They're already hacking at us with their swords. They've already knocked down a bunch of people with their horses. Um, it's already happening. 
and then they will use somebody in the unit which is supposed to be the commander but somebody in the unit will be form rally square and what you do then is you look for this this is an extremely important thing generally in the British Army there was two of them um, the king's color and the um, uh, a regimental color the regimental color generally speaking there are exceptions is a is a flag that is the color of the facing so there would be a yellow flag flying along next to this up in the corner generally speaking they'd have a smaller british flag but then the symbol of the regiment would be in the center and also the king's color which is this color here would have um painted or embroidered onto it um i think mostly painted but it depends on the era um the regimental sort of logo symbol that varies different armies different whatever so they would generally be two flags they were very important to make sure the enemy doesn't take them so when you get a rally square form rally square square all of these people look for this flag everybody looks for the or the pair of flags because they're kept right next to each other they generally have a color guard which has become a very ceremonial thing which would be a group of often corporals, I believe. Um, so trusted men that would march around next to the flag and never shoot their muskets. Always keep their muskets loaded. The idea was, the color guard was, is if, say, the horse guys or somebody else's charging up and trying to capture the color, they would then shoot anybody trying to capture one of the two colors of the unit. Otherwise, they don't shoot. You know, and so, and of course, they do stabby stabby with the bayonets to anybody that gets that close. Any 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 enemy that gets that close to their colors, so you know they're they're meant to to you know sure you stab with the bayonet as much as you know anybody gets there and shoot only when it becomes in danger. The color becomes in danger. So again, enemy getting that close, you often shot them first. But the loading and shooting of the standard guys, they would not participate in. So everybody would look for where that color is and then run to that color to form a rally square and that would be a not like a hollow square it would be a dense pack square so you no longer have the ability to load and shoot it is just simply to create sort of shall we say a porcupine of bayonets um, to keep mostly the cavalry away but it would also be if you're say if your line is broken by the infantry and they're doing you know breaking up that you're trying to form a, a solid line to fight them. Now, the French army before the um, French Revolution was a reasonably good army. It fought in this sort of manner. Once the revolution happened, um, the French army went to hell. Many of the units were royalist. Many of the units weren't. But they didn't trust them. They, they didn't trust the officers. They barely trusted the NCOs. A lot of the officers fled, so it, the army sucked. They did the first levy, real, the first real true proper, proper European levy in mass, which is basically a drafting of everybody. So this army sucks. So this is, like I've said, a nearly unbreakable formation. Oh, no, we, we want regular guys. Yes, sir. Okay. So what the French did, what, okay, um. Yes, sir. Was create this formation. Yes, sir. Okay. The French had very low ammunition levels. The French, most of the French soldiers probably had never fired a musket because they didn't have ammunition. The colors would not be at the front. The colors would be right about here in this column. This is a column. This is a French column, basically. Um, and so this was the France. French's answer mainly to the Austrian army at first, because that was what was up in the Austrian or Habsburg Netherlands that they were fighting fairly early on. Um, so they created this formation. It did load and shoot out of the first few ranks. Um, again, that's why you don't have the flags up here. But this formation was made to smash into this one. So let's, we can just pick this one up here. Yes, sir. And so, um, without turning around, but you could imagine if it was facing the other way, 
this formation coming at this one. Well, let's let's do this. Yes, sir. Okay, three ranks. Let's get to three ranks properly. Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so now maybe this would be better to be. Yeah, I don't know because you have early and late French Napoleonic columns. Okay, this is our fencible unit, which fencibles were um, regular soldiers that were in Britain that were um, by con by their employment con or their initial com. Yeah, this is actually pretty good. Um, this is a good French column. This is probably um, what an early revolutionary French column looks like. Uh, I'm going to relabel this episode. And yes, I'm just sort of guessing at the width, and they did change in various times. So, um, oh, well, it'd be easier to face this over here, I think. Okay, so. Oh, what are you doing coming here? So they would come at them like this. Do we have another one of these, or just two fencible units? Yeah, just two fencible units. Okay, well, we'll use this. Man, these guys are... Yes, sir. Badly faced versus that. Okay. So we can sort of see here. This is how they would come at the enemies with their bayonets. I'm just totally not satisfied with this. Yes, sir. Infantry reporting. Yes, sir. Militia awaiting orders, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, and so like I say, they varied yes, a bit in width depending sir. on when. Yes, and they were using the this French column up until the end, including with guards units. So sometimes they'd be tightly packed, sometimes they'd be loosely packed. And so this is what, with the levy and mass, they often had much, much larger armies. So this is what they were trying to do. Coming at them like this. Marching with lots of drums. They would generally have more drums um, in a French column marching so that you can effectively only shoot at the first few ranks because they'll be stopping the bullets so and the rear guys can't see what's happening in front so they keep moving forward until they are sort of stepping over dead and wounded bodies of their comrades so they keep coming at the enemy and keep coming at the enemy, and keep coming at the enemy, and keep coming at the enemy, and these guys start to get scared and often run away. The British, almost invariably, could see off the French column, because again, they were steady. Now, one thing you have to remember about the British army in the Napoleonic Wars and in the previous American Revolutionary War, in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian and the American War, the British Army was a 100% volunteer force. The British did not draft anybody. Now, talked about the levy in mass. That was the first mass everybody sort of gets drafted. But that doesn't mean that most of the European powers didn't draft people. They did. It just wasn't levy in mass. It was an attempt. Their drafting was attempts to have a large professional army, not a large army of the populace. There is a difference. The British army, because it was on an island, partially, but also partially because of the Civil War earlier and other things, didn't like or trust or want an army. They did not want to have an army. They knew they needed one. The government even sort of feared from, and I can talk about the Jacobite Risings and other things from internal disputes. Um, so they knew they needed an army, but no one liked the army. The army was often despised. The only people in the army that had any sort of status were officers. Generally, the army were thought to be sort of unwanted scum. Not a heroic or proud nation sponsor thing, and often sort of seen as much about 
um, oppressing their own population as um, defending their nation. That's what the army was viewed like, because if you have the army in Ireland, it's a Protestant ar ar army putting down the Catholic Irish. If you go up into Scotland, sure, absolutely, there was a Scottish establishment of soldiers, um, but it was often responding to, and then eventually, even though even though up until through the Napoleonic Wars, you have the Scottish establishment, um, which is sort of meaning as its own Scottish army, it's still part of now the unified Britain, it's looking upon as a foreign occupier. Or, or supporting of that, including building some of the first real proper oppressive garrison bases in the British Isles are built up in the Scottish Highlands to oppress the people. In the rest of Britain, down in England, it is looked as an oppressive force, so they did not like or want the army. So most of the army, most of the time, stood around at about one-third the strength that they're supposed to, meaning these units were often down at only one-third of the, the strength. Partly that was so that the owners of the regiments, I know I've talked about that before, could pocket the extra pay. Partially that was because not that many people wanted to come into it because they didn't pay very much money because the owners didn't um, want to pay. Normally to recruit soldiers in, they gave them a big bonus to join up out of the owner of the regiment's pocket. So without that bonus, nobody wanted to join up. So most people did not go into the army. It was looked on as very poorly, but it made for a very professional and very reliable army. What the British now, before you start thinking that the British government was some benevolent group that only looked for volunteers, they had um, press gangs, especially in port cities that would go around randomly picking up people and saying, you're in the Navy now, but I've never been to sea. Too bad, son, you're in the Navy now. Too, gra too bad, Grandpa, you're in the Navy now. Because they pressed and drafted. They were only supposed to do it in port areas and only supposed to be for sailors, but we all know that that wasn't the case. Um, so they, um, you can see the fencibles here, are, I guess, are faced in white instead of faced in um, yellow. But um, to be slightly different. So there, the British relied on the Navy for national defense. And so you have a smaller and more professional army. So when you have units like this coming at you, the British also knew that if you were getting to the, um, after you've shot at the enemy a lot, and you're getting into the stabby, stabby bits of this thing, only the front of this column can stab at you, not the rest. And if we take this away, and let's move this to here. Okay, this is obviously has interpenetrated the lines, but let's just say that these guys at the front are sort of that are intermixed are already dead somewhere. Now you have the ability for this formation here to start to wrap around these two columns. Okay, so like again, like forget all about the guys that are penetrated too deep. So now these guys here, if they're still you know alive, they're actually maximizing or um, they're maximizing their bayonet force, but they are at the points of contact because they're able to flank around them are actually able to have more people in the point of contact than the enemy force. That is also why the British were able to um, see off a lot of the French columns. Also, the, um, the British would put their formation back here, as you've seen me do. So the, the enemy columns would march up the hill, and then they get to the top of the starting coming over the crest of the hill and then get blasted at first in the face with musket shots and then charged a counter charge often um, by bayonet forces so um, this becomes a stampeding mob in the other direction so the British definitely have a superior way of doing it their superior way unfortunately cannot be replicated for the large armies because it's one hugely expensive to have large armies 
And two, you are diluting the quality of your troops because you're getting a lot of people that are more and more reluctant to be in the army. Uh, you know, so the army is a mixture of people for desperation because you didn't have social welfare programs. So if you didn't have food, you didn't have money for food, you didn't eat. So you went into the army in many places, in many cases. Um, now, in Britain, where you had, generally speaking, much better prospects, and if your prospects weren't very good, you could get on a boat to America until they lost it. But even after they lost it, you could still go to Canada. No one really wants to go to the Caribbean or South America because particularly those places are disease-ridden. Um, so many, many people don't want to go there. But you go to um, the northern enough climes in America, people want to go there. So Britain had an outlet for its poor that, say, Austria didn't. Well, did once when it had Spain, but still not that many people wanted to go there. Okay, that's why I'm fighting this battle to have this talk, and I'm going to relabel this as a talk about 18th century because this is in the Napoleonic era. The column only really shows up in the Napoleonic era, and I call it the Napoleonic era, but it starts in the Revolutionary period with their mass armies. Napoleon proper units were looking like that because they were better trained. Okay, somewhere out there is the enemy, so let's. We're going to forget about the two fencibles unit. They're not even going to be involved in this. Okay, let's start the battle. Before most artillery. Oh, pause. Where are they? Just as long as we pause. Oh, there they are. Okay. point this is overkill but I wanted to just sort of talk about various formations oh and getting a, a unit from a marching column to a line or other thing is also a complicated matter it is not something to just be presumed that you can do so we have an enemy here they've got two units of foot and some horses. Well, I think they might be able to harm us as horses if they timed that, an attack well. Though not win, just... take out some units. Oh, these, these are the light infantry. Well, cool. No, so you're there. I thought you were maybe somewhere else. Okay. Now, I often say light infantry up when I do this. These formations are very, very good, the light infantry. Because the men are not massed and packed in there, they are much harder to hit. Because, as I was talking to you earlier about how hard it is to hit an individual target with a musket in a with a military loadout. Civilian hunting loadouts were much more precise, and I could get into that sometime. I do own a musket and have loaded and shot it much, um, so I am rather familiar with how it all works. You know, familiar as in done it, know it, and can drill with it pretty pretty quickly. Um, though I never really went for speed because of the type of stuff I was doing at the time. Now, the problem with the light infantry is... Oh, oh, pause, 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 pause. Now, this is going to be much quicker to do. So, so we're going to form up. It looks like... Okay. Form... Oh, these are damn fencibles, are they? Damn it. 
Okay, um, come away, run away. They should have kept moving. Should not have moved up if they weren't going to charge. And these guys can't stand against it. But these guys, um, if you get the light infantry, if you get into the um, uh, using the bayonet stage, they're too spread out. To, to do so effectively. So if the, the enemy is coming at you with bayonet, light infantry are basically, are, are formed as light, light infantry. I mean, light infantry units were generally considered the elite of most nations. The French, that would be the Voltageers. Uh, I'm probably butchering that. Um... and other groups, um, Jaeger units and the German, various German armies, um, they were considered the elites and they could most assuredly form up, at least in most um, cases, form up into regular infantry type formations and would be able to quite readily function in that way and be, uh, we can move to regular speed, um, be quite able to, to do a good job. So if we are going to come and shoot at these guys, just shoot, I would much prefer to be in a light infantry formation because they will do rather good damage. Because you can see they're already shooting. They're going to hardly do much damage to these guys. So they'll be harder to hit. So if you were faced with a lot of light infantry, not like what's behind them, these guys should move up close, fire a few, few volleys, and then um, go in with the bayonets. So they're, they're, they're still there. There they are in the... Oh. oh, they have artillery somewhere here. Or something. I don't know what that boom was. I haven't seen artillery. In battle. Heroic victory. Well, of course. That wasn't the point of showing that off. Please let me know if you think I sh probably should, and I can do this better um, than I just did. This was impromptu. I could prepare notes on we are triumphant. different periods of tactics. Would it be good for me to look nation by nation Forwards! Forwards! at tactics? Would it be good to look time period by time period, or all of that? Britain around like 1690, Britain around 1715, Britain around um, 
1740s, Britain around 1750s, and because I can do all this, Britain around, um, you know, 1770s, the American Revolution era, and then um, Britain around the Napoleonic era. So I could divide all three of the, or all what, four or five of those periods up and talk about the various differences in their um, patterns and organization. Um, very much so. So, um, thank you for any put input you want to give on the subject. I would gladly hear it. Um, takes time to prepare though, so I haven't done anything like that yet, but would love to hear from you. Um, if you haven't already, please like the videos, please subscribe. See you next time for more historical gaming.